Amen. Say the blood of Jesus is against you, Satan. Worship God. Give him praise. Hallelujah. 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 Bless your name, God. We bless your name, God. We bless your name, God. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. We lift up your name, God. We lift up your name, God. We lift you up in praise, King of kings and Lord of lords. You are worthy, God. You are worthy, God. You are worthy, God. Amen. Amen. Say this. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. To the pulling down of strongholds. Let's say it again. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Amen. Let's worship him again. Let's praise him again. Mighty God, King of kings and Lord of lords, we worship you, God, tonight. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Amen. Say this. The angel of the Lord encamps round about them that fear him, and he delivers them. Let's give God praise for that in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Say with me, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Let's give him praise again. Say with me, they overcame him. By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives unto the death. Let's give God praise. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Say with me, let us enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Let's worship and bless his name right now. We glorify your holy name, God, today. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. It's good to be in the house of God tonight once again. Pray for Sister Adele tonight. She is in severe pain on her ear and the side of her head. Let's trust God, amen, to, to heal. Thank you, brother. To heal her as she comes, amen. Praise the Lord. In the name of Jesus, let's stretch forth that the prayer of faith, the Bible says, this, <clears throat> will save the sick. Let's exercise our faith in God tonight. Hallelujah. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, we command healing in your name by your stripes, mighty God. That you would heal the ear, God. You would heal the side of the head, Father, right now, God. Release your healing power and virtue upon her, O oh God. Let your anointing, God, flow through her right now. Let your healing power and virtue be released, God, into her heart, into her life, into her body, God, for healing in the name of the Lord Jesus. We command, God, this pain to go away. We command healing in the name of Jesus. We stand upon your word, O oh God, and we declare it done, Father God, in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Let's give God praise. Amen, amen, amen. What a mighty God he is. Anybody recognize this? Is this anybody's here? Black brush? Yes, sir. That's yours, brother. Okay. God bless you. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Good to be in the house of God tonight. Turn in your Bibles, please, over to uh, the Kings. We're in 2 Kings chapter 6.
Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Amen. And we will begin there in verse 13. If you have it, say praise the Lord. <clears throat> Hallelujah. And he said, go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host. They came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, the host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, look at your name and say, fear not. Wow. Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Let's say it together. He answered, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. That is the truth. That is the truth. They that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. He smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said unto them, This is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. It came to pass when they were come into Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, Open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. The king of Israel said unto Elisha when he saw them, My father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? And he answered, Thou shalt not smite them. Wouldest thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive with thy sword and with thy bow? Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And he prepared a great provision for them. When they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away. And they went to their master. So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now. We ask your blessing to be upon the reading of your holy word. We give you all glory and honor and praise and worship. We thank you tonight, God. For the truth that makes us free. In Jesus' name. Title of the message is found in verse 16. They that be with us are more than they that be with them. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. When we look at this story, the scripture tells us that when the king of Syria warred against Israel, he took counsel with his servants and he would tell them in such and such a place would be his camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. <laughs> And the king of Israel sent to the place where, which the man of God told him and warned him of and saved himself there not once nor twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet 
that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. I love it. The key to the passage here is this. Bind the strong man and you take the house. God was using Elisha to bind the strong man, the leader of Syria, so that Israel could take the house. So what the king of Syria does, he comes up with a plan to take the strong man, Elisha. Because he knew if he could take the prophet and bind the prophet, he would take the house. That is the key. So the enemy will strive to great lengths to bind the strong man of a house. He will seek to take out the servants of the Lord because he knows that if he can do that, he's got the house. Anybody that's in the house of God tonight and you are strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, get ready. The enemy is going to do everything he can to take you out. Because he knows if he can take the strong man, maybe not, you might not be the strong man over this house, but you're the strong man over your house. And he knows. So he goes after the strong in any family to seek to take them down. Because he knows if he can do that, then he can wipe the whole house out. So the closer you get to God, The closer you walk with the Lord, the stronger you are in God. Get ready for a greater battle. Because the enemy is going to try to take that strong man out so he can take the whole house. You realize that? Amen. With being strong comes battle. We need to understand tonight that that's the key. Buying the strong man, take the house. So we bind, Jesus said this in the Gospel of Matthew twelve twenty nine. he said that. That if we bind the strong man, Satan, then we can plunder his house. But we see in the text that the enemy seeks to bind the strong man, the prophet, so he could take the house. And the prophet is relying on angelic help to get him the victory when that happens. And so as this host comes down to get the prophet to bind the strong man, God has already showed Elisha the angelic hosts that are round about in the mountains. And they that be with him are more than they that be with them. Praise the Lord. And it's round about Elisha. When we were in Taiwan... Maybe the first or the second time that we were in Taiwan, uh, God put this text in my spirit to preach to them. And I noticed at that time is a certain time of the year that they were practicing some very odd things. They would get their idols and they would walk with their idols and, uh, you know, like the Buddhas or whatever, And as they did, they had a very strange thing that they would do. They'd have a top that would be spinning on a stick like this. And God put that in my spirit to preach about the angels being round about Elisha. And when I saw that, I said, what is that? What does that mean that that they carry this, this top that's spinning like that? And I found out it is to attract... Attract spirits. Now how is it that this spinning top can attract spirits? Because evidently those spirits at one time understood round about. They understood the way the heavenly host operates. The Bible says they were round about Elisha. And so they would walk and they would worship these false gods with these spinning tops to attract these fallen spirits to empower them. 
And God sent me there to preach about the one God, the true God of the Bible and the angelic host that was available to those people in Taiwan. And as a result of that, we marched around that meeting place. And Taiwan people, if you know anything about the Taiwanese, they're not really emotional people. They're real reserved people. So if you can get the Taiwanese to respond, there's something there. And so these Taiwanese people, they got up. The word was preached. They understood about the spinning top and the attraction of false spirits. And they got up and they began to march around that place in victory. Very unique for the Taiwanese to do that. And the power of God began to move. Because there's something about angels that are attracted by the movement of the marching in a circle. Amen. Amen. So tonight I'm going to preach to you about they that are with us are more than they that are against us. We need to know that today. <laughs> because the battle is intense. First know the enemy is going to do everything he can to take the strong man down everything then he can plunder the house but we're not on the defense we're on the offense so we're the ones that's charging the gates of hell and the gates of hell will not prevail against just the church we're not running from him we're not afraid of the enemy when I tell you that he seeks to take down the strong man whether it be you or anybody else that's something you should know as a warrior that should not create intimidation in you and worry in you. That, that If you're a warrior in the kingdom of God, in the church of Jesus Christ, not in the church of the world, but in the church of Jesus Christ. If you're in the church of Jesus Christ, then you're a warrior and you know that. So that doesn't intimidate you. You know that's going to happen. But we need to know that we have with us more than they that are against us. And sometimes we can't see them. And so just like God told or Elisha prayed to God and said, Would you open the servant's eyes that he may see? Because there's two kinds of eyesight. There's natural eyesight, which I can see and you can see right now natural things. But then there's the ability to see the unseen. I can see natural things because of light that is working in the eye that God has created in me. But I cannot see the second sight, which is in, in the invisible world, unless God shows it to me by, bring, listen, by bringing a different kind of ray. To hit my eyeball. I see naturally by what the light is doing here today. You turn the lights off. I can't see a thing. Nor can you. But the light is hitting the eye. And it lets you see what is out there. But God has a supernatural light. That if he chooses to. He can hit your eye with. And you'll see a second vision if you will. That is supernatural. You will see what cannot be seen. Elisha was used to walking this way. He was used to walking in a way that the unseen could be seen. His servants could see naturally. But Elisha could see a second visual. And that was a supernatural sight of angelic hosts. Tonight... The Bible says this, that angels are sent to us who are to be the heirs of salvation. Right now, I can't see anything but naturally. But I tell you by the word of God that if you are a child of God, that every one of you here tonight, if you're a child of God, you brought your angel with you. If you're an heir of salvation, 
God's angel is with you tonight. So they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Even though I, and God could show it to you. God can make it visual to you so you can see them. But they are here tonight. And you might not be able to see them with your eyes. But by faith you know it's the truth. There are angels in this house. There are angels that are assigned to this platform. And if you could see them tonight, and I've only on a couple occasions seen them. But here, as soon as I said that, the skeptical mind kicks in. And said, now we got somebody that claims to see angels. Brothers and sisters, let me explain something to you. If you think that only the elite see angels, you're wrong. Balaam saw an angel, and Balaam was an elite. So when I say I've seen an angel a couple of times, that don't make me elite. That, that don't make me some kind of special, you know, person. If you're walking with God and you're a child of God, don't be surprised if God shows you an angel. They say, well, I'm not worthy. <laughs> you, don't, you don't get the point. But if you were able to see the angels of God tonight that are on this platform, they would be standing in military attention. Not saying a whole lot, but dressed in military apparel, standing in military attention. And if you could see those angels, you would see them move like soldiers. They would not be saying very much because they're on assignment to do what God sent them to do and they don't do a lot of talking about it. They just go and get the job done. So you would see them moving like a soldier on a mission. They wouldn't be saying too much. They would go and do what God has sent them to do and they would finish the job and that's it. They wouldn't do any more than that or any less than what God has told them to do. They would come like soldiers. And if they're not moving, they would stand in attention like soldiers. They would, none of them, be wearing a beard. Because angels of God don't wear beards. There is no angel in your Bible that ever wore a beard. And men of God who have seen angels say that they don't have beards. Uh-oh. So they come like soldiers wearing military-type apparel. They stand in attention until it's time for them to move. If it's a Holy Ghost-type uh, of service where people get seeking the Holy Ghost, they will literally go and stand at attention, and they will watch when people are receiving salvation. In 1 Peter chapter 1, the Bible says the angels desire to look into the Holy Ghost. They don't understand salvation because they know if, if a person or Satan rebelled, he got cast out immediately out of heaven. There was no grace or no mercy. But, he's, but they see angels, see men receiving salvation, but not just salvation, God coming and living inside of them. And they don't affect that. They don't produce that salvation in a human being. So men like Kenneth Reeves, who was a friend of T.W. Barnes, a powerful prophet of the Lord, that man saw angels and he talked about how those angels would come and they would stand at attention in altar service when people received the Holy Ghost and they would just watch what was going on because they could not affect that salvation. They could not do anything with that. Now, when it comes to the physical, however... Whenever people are being prayed for, because it's the physical body, not salvation, but the physical body, angels, they said, Kenneth Reeves said, will come and actively be involved in the physical aspect of man. So when people are being prayed for to be healed in their bodies, these angels, they say they come up here, those angels, as we're praying, they'll get right up in there. And they're actively involved in 
uh, the physical needs of the person, but they can't affect the salvation of the person. Are you understanding this tonight? See, we need to know that they that are with us are more than they <coughs> that are with them. <clears throat> so when I look at this, I'm going to say, first of all, there's approximately 100, and, 100 million angels. Look at your neighbor and say, 100 million angels. Did you hear that? 100 million where do you get that? 10,000 times 10,000. 10,000 times 10,000 equals 100 million. Think about that. One passage, I believe it's Hebrews chapter 12, tells us that we are come, amen, to Mount Zion to an innumerable company of angels. So we could go 100 million, that's a lot, 10,000 times 10,000. Or we can go with what other text says, they're just innumerable. Amen. But let's just take the smaller number of 10,000 times 10,000, which is 100 million angels. And if a third of the angels got cast out of heaven, that means around 33 million or so got cast out of heaven. Now that means that there's two Angels, amen. Let me put it to you this way. There's a majority with you. There's twice as many angels because only one-third fell. There's twice as many angels to help you and to help me than there are those that are falling. Amen. So whatever the enemy tries to hit you with, the enemy tries to come and bring temptation to you, there's two angels that will help you to overcome that. If the enemy comes against you to, to cause you to be depressed and discouraged and to go into despair and anxiety, there's two angels to fight that. The point is, you and I have the majority tonight. So now whatever the enemy throws at you, there's twice as many on your side. They that are with you are more than they that are against you. Woo, praise the Lord. Angels, we don't worship them, but they're real. And they're here tonight. They don't operate like we do. Knowledge comes to us bits and pieces at a time. But an angel operates in instant knowledge. An angel operates in immediate knowledge. They don't have to remember anything like you and I do. It just comes to them. They know instantly and immediately. Are y'all with me here today? Give God praise in the house. But two-thirds of the angels are with us. Versus one third that are against us. And one angel killed over 180, what is that, 184, 185,000 soldiers in one night. Look at your neighbor and say, they that are with us are more than they that are, are against us. Are they that be with them? Now I could get really excited here and just let my excitement run away with me. But I'm going to take my time and I'm going to explain some things to you. Amen. A couple of times I've seen angels. Rare occasion. Doesn't make me special. Doesn't make me elite. Nothing like that. Not long ago, Brother Yates, he texted me on the telephone. And when he was with us, I was talking to him about a certain decision that he was trying to make. And when it comes to Brother Yates, I don't really put myself in a position of counseling him because I have such great respect for the man. You know, I just don't put myself in that place of being like telling him. But we were just talking in passing about some things. And again, I wouldn't put myself in a place of being his counselor. But just in the conversation, I shared some things with him that were important to him that I didn't even know. And so time went by and he texted me one night and uh, it's not 
often that he does that. But he texted me one night, and he, he was telling me about some things that were happening in his life and that I had talked to him about that in the past. And he says, I thank God for the gift that is working in you because evidently what I talked to him about helped him. What I did was, I didn't, after I got the text, I didn't go back to bed. I felt led to pray for him. So I got up out of the bed, and I went to my office, and I began to pray for him. And as I was making my way uh, to pray for Brother Yates, I saw a vision of an angel. Woo! Mm. And this angel was walking with Brother Yates. Brother Yates, it was dark. It was at night. He was walking down. He was outside. He was walking down a pathway. And I saw this angel with a sword drawn in his hand. He was walking with Brother Yates, and Brother Yates went down into a valley. And that angel went with him into the, wherever Brother Yates went. That angel went with him with that sword drawn. And when the enemy tried to come and destroy him, and that was sort of what he was going through, that angel of God sat there with a sword drawn. <laughs> defeating, defeating the enemies of Brother Yates. When he was here with us, I said, Brother Yates, I said, were you, that night when I prayed and I was texting him when I was seeing, I said, were you walking outside when I sent that to you? He said, no, I was inside. Amen. But I believe that God sent his angel to help Brother Yates to deal with a very difficult situation. So I can tell you I've seen in vision an angel. God wants you to have visions. Not just visions about what you're going to do in the kingdom of God. But he wants you to have visions like Daniel had visions. He... God, angels appear to the men of God. The patriarchs throughout the Old Testament. He appeared to Elisha here. All through the Bible you have these angels appearing to people. They're real. The second time that I remember today as I was preparing was years and years and years ago when we first started the church. I had a dream. And the Bible talks about Jacob had a dream. And in that dream, there were angels ascending and descending upon the Lord, a ladder. So I know it's biblical to see angels in dreams. The first thing I do with a dream is I take it to the Word of God and see if it's biblical. So I had this dream and saw these two angels show up. The context of the dream was this. I saw the women in the church sitting at a table fellowshipping together. Holy women. And I saw that the spirit of Jezebel had come to our assembly and was moving on the women of the church to forsake their holiness. I saw holy women of God with their faces painted. And I knew I needed help. And in the dream, God sent two angels to help me defeat the spirit of Jezebel that would seek to come to this church and tempt the women of God to forsake their holiness before God. I, I thank God today that God sent his angels to help me. And, and just as I said, they didn't say one word. They walked in and positioned themselves. And God was letting me know, I'm here to help you. See, sometimes the enemy will come to you and tell you it's too strict and it's too radical. But I'm telling you tonight. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. There is power in your holiness before God. There is power with God. Angels walk with women who do not cut their hair. That's why oftentimes when a woman backslides away from God, the first thing that goes is the hair. Because you have power with angels when you let your hair grow long. Give God praise in the house. 
When you live holy before God, you have power with God and with angels. So the enemy is going to try to take your holiness. He will tell you that it's too radical. He will tell you it's too strict. Are you understanding what I'm telling you? Brother Reed said this, and I don't think he's still alive anymore. But he said this one time. He said that there were seven spirits that came to him. Uh, I think it's in the night. I don't remember exactly the time. It's the day or night. But these seven spirits, he said, came from a charismatic church that was close to his church. And he said those spirits were dressed in white. They stood before him and they said to him, you are too radical. When you require people to receive the Holy Ghost, when you preach Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, and they shall receive the Holy Ghost. And those seven spirits dressed in white from that charismatic church said, you need to abandon this radical teaching that you have. Are you understanding? And Brother Reese, knowing the word of God, looked at those seven spirits from that charismatic church. And he said this, according to John chapter 17, we are to believe on Jesus according to their words. Whose words? The apostles' words. So get out. He said, so get out. And those seven spirits, because they had no right to be there, had to leave. He said, it wasn't too much longer that those same seven spirits came to him, but this time they were dressed in black. They tried to get him to doubt the word of God, the Bible that he preached. And said, you know what you need to do is you need to get rid of the Bible and just tell people to believe in God. Kenneth Reeves looks at them and he says this. Jesus said, if you believe as the scripture has said, out of your bellies shall flow liver, rivers of living water. And they had to leave. I tell you tonight in the Holy Ghost that there are spirits that will come. Religious spirits that will come and disguise themselves as angels of light and tell you it's too radical or it's too strict, etc., etc. But we're going to do the same thing. We're going to believe on him according to the apostles' words. And when they tell us to lay aside the Bible and just believe on God like so many churches today, we're going to say the same thing. We're going to believe on Jesus according to the scriptures. If you believe as the scripture has said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Give God a hand clap of praise. We're almost a dying breed. You are rare in the world today, in the earth today. When I say that, I mean a church that walks in holiness, that walks according to the Word of God, not legalism. I'll get to that later on. We are not to walk in legalism, but we are to walk in holiness because there is power in that. But you better believe the enemy is going to come after that. They go, oh, it's too strict, it's too radical. Oh, no, in Jesus' name. We're going to keep preaching the Bible. We're going to keep believing the Bible. Amen. <coughs> We're going to keep living holy. We're going to keep preaching holiness. <coughs> Somebody said, 
I was in a conference years ago, and I heard a preacher say this, that he knew another minister, and this minister went on a time of prayer and fasting. And this minister, after a time of prayer and fasting, came back with a so-called revelation that they didn't need holiness anymore. Well, it sounds good, doesn't it, that the man was praying and fasting, and he got this new revelation that holiness wasn't needed. The response of the man that was preaching, he said this, Obedience is better than sacrifice. You, fa you fasted, in your fasting you sacrificed, but you laid aside your obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. I heard about another preacher that stood up in a Pentecostal church and was, you know, sort of testing the spirit of that church and was talking about, you know, do we really need holiness anymore? Do we really need these standards anymore, you know? And some of the liberals in the church, they were getting all excited. Like we, we fix to get freedom. That's what they thought. He set the trap. So after, he, you know, they saw the ones that were responding, he ought to get rid of the standards, you know. Then he, then he preached the standards. I'm pretty sure there were some people that got real quiet. <clears throat> Wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But we need, know, we need to know those that labor among us. We need to know those that labor with us. We need to know who is really with us and, and who isn't with us. The times are too dangerous. But I tell you, they that be with us are more than they that be with him. Woo. Look at your neighbor and say, they help us fight. They help us war. Angels come to make things known. Listen, listen to what I'm about to say. They work with the prophets to make things known. In the prophet Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 1 through Zechariah chapter 5, you're going to see that God sends an angel of the Lord to work with the prophet to make, make things known to the prophet. In the book of Revelation, the Bible says that the book of Revelation was given to John by an angel. The Bible says God sent his angel to signify the things in the book of Revelation. So angels work with prophets to show them things, amen, to make things known. Mm. But when you look in the book of Revelation... Very interesting. You don't see the designation of apostle there. The highest level of office in the book of Revelation is prophet, not apostle. But in the book of Revelation, like Zechariah, the book of Apocalypse, you have many movements of angels in that book. When you study the book of Revelation, you will find out that... God speaks of the servants of the Lord. Amen. The servants of the Lord. The doulos, the bond servants, the bond slaves of God. He doesn't even call them sons. He calls them servants. And the reason why God does that is he lets you know that the angels work with the bond slaves or the bond servants to help them accomplish what the master's will is. So when you study the book of Revelation, it is to reveal Jesus. The apocalypse is a revelation of Jesus Christ. But it's also God showing his servants the troubles they're going to go through. 
the battles, the strivings, the temptations that you're going to go through. But God is showing you as a servant that he's sending his angels to make things known to you. A servant doesn't know what his master does. So his master reveals to the servant what his will is and he does what the master tells him to do. And so in times of trouble, in times of problems, in times of trial, in times of striving, in times of straining, in times of attack, in are you here today? God comes with angels to the doulos, to the bond slaves of God to get you through that time. Are you understanding this? A servant of God, a servant of a master is more concerned about doing the will of the master than the people that he serves. I'm going to say that again. You get somebody that is a servant of God they're more concerned with doing the will of the master than he is concerned with the people that he serves. Amen. What that means is you get somebody that's a servant of God. Are you understanding? If it's God's will for, the, for that servant to hurt, they will hurt for the sake of the master. Because doing his will is more important to the servant than it is the service that he's giving to people. Because they're like soldiers. When you have somebody that's a servant or a soldier uh, in a nation, sometimes they got to go and kill some people. To protect or to obey the master. And they're willing to go and fight. And they're willing to go and hurt. And they're willing to go and kill. Because the master said so. The most important thing to them is to obey the master. That's why servants will do and say anything that God tells them. It doesn't matter if, and I know, I'm not saying hurt in the sense of trying to be malicious. But if somebody's a threat to the kingdom of God, if somebody is a threat to God, if so, I don't care who it is, if it's family, friend, or foe, they will always stand with God, always. They will not stand with their family against God because the most important thing to them is obeying God above all else. That's why you're called servants. Because you have to have that mindset. I'm going to stay faithful to God even if it means hurting somebody. You get on the right side of God and there won't be no war. But you get on the wrong side of God and the battle is on. Mm. The battle is on. Because I'm his servant. He's my master. And I'm going to do whatever he tells me. It don't matter who gets hurt in the process. Some servants are weak. Soft as butter. Little problem with their children. Think more of their children than they do God. You cannot be a servant of God and love your children more than you love your God. At some point, you got to draw the line. Say praise the Lord. I now mark you as an enemy to the kingdom of God. I mark you. I know you're flesh and blood, but you're not with me right now. Can two walk together except they be agreed? The answer is no. So to the servants of God tonight, 
who no matter what it costs you, you'll walk with the Lord. Then angels are sent to the bond servants. They are sent to the servants of God that are fulfilling the master's will and purpose in this world. And those angels reveal to those people the will of the master. And they go forth that it's number one priority. It is number one priority. There is no other priority that is greater than that for a servant in relationship to the master. That means he will govern every aspect of your life and mine. Your emotion, he governs that. He governs our mouth. He governs our life. He governs the way we respond. He governs everything. What is the master saying to me right now? So in the book of Revelation, you will see. You will see angels throughout the book of Revelation. Working with the servants and working with the prophets of God. Revealing the plan and purpose of God in the earth. Give God a hand clap of praise. I'm encouraging you tonight. To stay strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He does not even call you a son. Although you are. Until you get to the end of the book of Revelation. And it is only to the overcomer that he says, sons. Titles of sonship from fathers are handed out too quick. Because until you learn to be a servant... You cannot be a son. Woo, I feel the Holy Ghost. Mm. Now I say, Galatians 4, 1, that the heir, as long as he is a child, differ nothing from a servant. Though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. You understand? So he says, until we mature, we're known as servants. Although we are sons, because we're not mature yet, God says you're a servant. So I've got to tell you what I'm doing. I've got to find out if you're loyal to me. I've got to see you grow up. I'm going to put some things in your life as a servant to see how you'll handle them. And when you do get it and you obey the master, then now as an overcomer, you're no longer considered a servant because you are matured in God. Now you can be called a son of God. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Let me just tell you something. As your pastor, you don't think I can discern your spirit in a heartbeat. I'm going to tell you right now. What we need to understand is that, well, God's just not using me. And I just don't understand why I'm getting overlooked right now. Because there are times when you can come to church and God will pass you by, walk by you. And you don't even know he was there. Because you haven't grown up yet. Hallelujah to the Lamb. You can't even take care of yourself. You can't even take care of your family. And you think you're ready for the big time. So God's going to check us out. Test you as servants. I'm going to obey the master. That's why God will look at you sometimes as a servant and require things from you that doesn't make sense to anybody. Why is God requiring that of me? Because he's testing me to see if I'm a servant or not. Somebody said, praise the Lord. Would you like it better if I just confined myself behind the pulpit? (laughs) 
I'm trying to keep my emotion down so I can get the word of God to you. But when you look at the book of Revelation, over and over and over the term servant is used. And angels are moving there among the servants of God to show them, hey, you're going to strive. You're going to strain. There's going to be pressure. There's going to be trouble that's going to come to you. What are you going to do with it? How are you going to handle that? Are you going to quit God, backslide, apostatize? Are you going to, I'm going forward. I'm serving my master. I can't be bought. I don't have a price. Woo. Brothers and sisters, you don't think demonic powers know that? When you've been tested, tried, proven, and you're faithful to God still, no matter what the enemy throws at you or offers you, you're still with God. They thought they could throw this at you or that at you. Oh, we got them now. No, 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 no. And you're still standing. You're still worshiping God. You're still praising God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Because more are with you than they that be with Him. You are in the majority. The majority is with you. You are walking with angels. I I should say, angels are walking with you. Hallelujah. So whatever the enemy throws at you, there's twice as many to get you through it. Revelation 5, an innumerable company of angels. Revelation 12, Michael war. Michael and his angels war with the devil and his angels. We need angels, and they're with us. Look at your neighbor and say, they're our friends. Angels are your friends. Angels are my friends. Angels are on your side. Angels are on my side. They that be with us are more than they that be with them. And you better believe it tonight. I've got, I've got a motive. I'm taking the battle to the gate. I told you this morning, the enemy hit us Wednesday night after church. I made up my mind to hit him 10 times harder. You better believe I've got a motive tonight. I'm coming back strong. I'm coming back. I'm hitting him hard. Hallelujah. By not allowing depression, not allowing despair, not allowing darkness. Doing some damage to his kingdom. Woo. Give God praise, would you? Even God, even God himself, when the law was given on Mount Sinai, the Bible said the law was given by the disposition of angels. What does that mean? It means that God, who is not an angel, took on the form of an angel and gave the law. There are times... When even God, who is not an angel, appeared as the angel of the Lord. Would you give God praise in the house? Because in this world, we need to know that they that be with us are more than they that be with Him. Angels ministered to Jesus when He was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying. Great drops of blood fell from his brow. The devil's trying to kill him right there. 
Are y'all hearing me right now? The devil tried to kill him before he ever got to Calvary because he knew if he could stop him from getting to Calvary that you and I couldn't be saved. So the Bible says as Jesus was praying, angels came and ministered unto him. How many times the enemy has come against you. You felt like you, it was over. You were done with. You felt like you couldn't go on any further. But God sent his angels to minister unto you. And you got back in the saddle. And you're riding again. Peter gets thrown in jail. And the Bible says... The angel of the Lord is sent there to minister to Peter. And he opens the doors of the prison. And Peter walks out. A free man. <coughs> They're having a prayer meeting in Rhoda's house. <coughs> no doubt praying for Peter. Oh, Lord. Be with poor Peter over in prison. <coughs> Lord, save Peter. Deliver Peter from prison, Lord. And Peter gets out. An angel of God was sent from God, no doubt because of their prayer. And Peter's angel, they thought. But it was Peter himself stood at the door of Rhoda's house when prayer was wont to be made. She looks out. And it's Peter. But she goes back in and she says, Peter's angel standing at the door. They no doubt been praying for his release, but they think, well, like Ronald Reagan, well, he's dead. Because <laughs> they thought once a man died, his angel roamed or his spirit roamed for three days before he went on. So they thought Peter had been killed. No, that was Peter standing at the front door, you know. And they were praying for his deliverance. Sometimes the hardest door to get through is not the doors of the prison. The hardest door to get through is the door of the church. Let God in. Let miracles in. Let So that means Prophet Ismail was you're over there in Zambia in the future and you see me show up there and I'm not there, I'm here. You know what that means? My angel went when I couldn't. Because the angel that walks with you looks like you. Because they are spirits. Give God praise in the house. I could have swore I saw a pastor out in the front yard. That wasn't pastor. Might have been his angel. Give the Lord a hand and clap of praise. Woo! But those demonic spirits, the fallen ones, they come to depress you. Oftentimes, when a person is, is, is moving out of character, they're not what they would normally be. It is because there's demonic spirits that have come to oppress them, to discourage them, to harass them. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We think it's just, you know, we're just depressed. But those are spirits that are coming. Hallelujah to the Lamb. God comes to help you when you're going through things physically. Your spirits say, but at times in your life, you go through physical ailments. You go through some emotional, some mental things that you're going through. And you need God to come and help you. Like the, the man that was laying on the porch, the Bible said he waited there for an angel to come and trouble the waters. 
And whoever got in the water when the waters were troubled by the angels was healed. The problem is there was no man to help the man on the porch get in the waters when they were troubled. So Jesus walks by and he heals the man. Hallelujah to the Lamb. If an angel can't get to you, or you can't get to an angel, the Lord himself will walk by and heal you. But angels are sent to help you recover from your physical ailments. Angels come to restore you. If they can't hit you with emotional distress, they'll hit you with physical ailments. But God's got angels to help us. Look at your neighbor and tell them God's got angels to help us. They come after you as I gave you the example of those spirits. Seven spirits from a charismatic church dressed in white that tried to get Kenneth Reeves to depart from the radicals. They called the radical truth of the apostolic faith. And Brother Kenneth Reeves says, no. I'm to believe on him according to their words, John 17. And said, get out, and they left. They will come to seek to tell you it's too radical. It's too hard. It's too strict. Come on, somebody. Don't fall for it. Those are spirits. There are people that get healed in their body by spirits that they think are angels. But what happens is the healing that they receive from that spirit it leaves. The question has to be asked. When you saw a spirit, Kenneth Reese talked about a woman that got healed in her body. An angel came and ministered in her body with a, uh, there was, she was sick. And when that angel came, she got healed. But the healing went away. So the question was asked this woman, where did you see the spirit coming from? She said, I saw this angel spirit coming from the underworld. He said, that's your answer. You always have to look at and determine where the spirit came from. If it came from the underworld, it's not one of God's angels. It's a fallen angel. If it came from the heavens. Where'd that spirit come from that gave you that direction? Did it come from the underworld or did it come from the heavens? They couldn't get him on the first one with disguising themselves as pure angels. They came back and dressed in black, black robes and said, you know what you need to do? You need to abandon this little book right here and not preach it. It's just too restrictive. Just abandon it, get rid of it, and just tell people to believe in God. They said, because God is bigger than this book. Kenneth Reeves said, Jesus said, if I believe as the scripture has said, get out of here. Are you here right now? Are there spirits coming after you to depart from the faith in this hour? What you got to do is tell them, get out of here. This is the kingdom of God. You have no place here. You're trying to win souls, teach Bible studies, pray people through the Holy Ghost. Brothers and sisters, there's times there are spirits that will come and hinder those people from getting the Holy Ghost. And you have a hard time getting them through and you can't figure it out. What you got to do, there are spirits that are there. You got to tell them, get out of here. Because this is the kingdom of God. You have no business here. And when now, now the person's free to worship. The person's free to pray. The person can move in God now because the spirit that was hindering them, you sent them out. You have to send them away. You have to command them to get out. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Demons cause you to be afraid. I told you this morning, 
when you make a declaration and you say nothing can move me. When you say I will serve my God no matter what. When you make that declaration the enemy will come and talk to you and say you know you better not talk so bold because I'm going to make it harder on you. He's a liar. Because they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And I'm going to show you seven things that scare the devil tonight. Are y'all with me tonight? And the first one I'm going to talk about when I get there is the profession of your faith. That when you witness, when you make a statement, a testimony, when it comes out of your mouth, you have power over the devil. That's why he wants to keep your mouth shut. Because he knows if he can stop you from witnessing. He knows if he can stop you from testifying. He knows that you have a hard time overcoming him. So open your mouth and testify. Open your mouth and take a stand. Open your mouth and make a declaration in the name of the Lord. Oh, spirits. I know how it is because they try to come against me sometimes. And, you know, well, don't be so bold. Don't make such bold declarations, you know. Because uh, you're going to be tested tomorrow. I know I'm going to be tested. But I believe, as I said this morning, that if I'm making a profession that will glorify God, God's got my back. And God's got your back. And when I, and I've said it more than one time, when I said the devil hit us one time, I'm hitting him ten times harder. I meant that. So when I pray, I'm praying harder. When I pray, I'm praying. I've got something moving me now. I'm putting the devil under my feet. Come on in the name of Jesus. I'm not intimidated by the enemy. But that spirit, that demon of fear will come. I learned a lot from Kenneth Reeves. He said there was a woman, that young woman, she came, she was shaking and trembling in fear. He knew that there was a spirit of fear that was working on her. So he said, put your hand. He said, I'm anointed right now. God's anointing is on me, he said. So take your hand and put it on my hand. She took her trembling hand. He said her whole body was shaking. She took her trembling hand, put it on his hand. Her hand stopped shaking. But the rest of her kept shaking. You talk about an odd sight. Because God's anointing stopped that fear. He said this other hand was shaking. He said now take the other hand and put it on my hand. And when you do that hand's going to stop shaking. She took her hand put it on his hand. That demon of fear didn't have any power over her. Both of the hands stopped shaking. But the re- the, her arms. All of her body was shaking. With fear. He told her, he said, don't be afraid. He said, that's a demon of fear. Are y'all understanding? God has not given you a spirit of fear, but one of love and power and of a sound mind. Give God praise in this house. You're not losing your mind. The devil is a liar. You're not going to go crazy. God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but one of love, power, and a sound mind. No demon can stand before the name of Jesus. Get on out of here. Get on out of here. This is the kingdom of God. You don't. 
You don't belong here. Get out of here. In the name of Jesus. Hobo spirits. Hobo spirits. Hobo spirits are lazy spirits. They're not mad or sad when they come. They're not moved or touched by anything. They can come to church and the most powerful message that can be preached does not move a person that has a hobo spirit. Because that spirit always brings so-so with them. Just be so-so. Don't be anything great. Don't respond. Be lazy. Be a hobo. They they don't get excited. They don't move with God. It doesn't matter how powerful the message is. A hobo spirit is not moved. And they just, they kind of move nonchalantly. If a hobo spirit is removed out of a person's life, you see them walk. See, these spirits that we talk about are not always mad or sad spirits or spirits that bring fear or intimidation. Many of them are not courageous, bold spirits. They're hobo spirits. And I've preached to people in my ministry that had a hobo spirit. But the problem is, it so disguised itself into their personality that you couldn't tell that they had it because it was so much like them. And that's what a demonic spirit does. It comes to you, it comes to me, and disguises itself in our personality so we can't discern, or maybe we can by God, but they look just like you. So you see somebody with a hobo spirit. Nothing moves them. Are you understanding me? Look at your neighbor and say, they're just happy to be so-so. Not moved. Not touched. Woo. A spirit, you think a spirit wants to be found out? You think a spirit, it's going to disguise itself, right? Okay. So let's say, let's say, I'm not going to talk about any of you. I'll talk about myself, right? Amen. But let's say I like to talk a lot. (laughs) Amen. So you know what? There's a spirit that's just like my personality. Mr. Talk a lot. Amen. Mr. Blowhard. So that spirit watches you and he watches me. And if I got a problem talking a lot, here he comes and he connects himself with my personality. And now that talk a lot becomes intensified and I just become a blowhard like him. Right. 
Are y'all all right out there? Hey, everybody, are y'all still here? Yeah, I think I can see you. If you're a scaredy cat, no, I'm not talking to you. Let me talk to myself. If I'm a scaredy cat, you know, guess what's going to happen? There's going to be a spirit just like that personality that's going to come and connect itself with me so that I can't discern between myself and the spirit. Woo! So, if I'm always afraid all the time, there's a scared demon coming to me. Don't lift your hand, but how many of y'all can't sleep at night? Well, you just think, well, I'm just having insomnia. Well, you might have insomnia, but once the devil finds out you got insomnia, he's going to come, a sleepless devil, and keep you up all night long. And you wonder why little Johnny can't go to sleep. He's up in the bed doing this all night. He's banging against the walls. Moses, go to sleep. Boing, boing. I'm trying to, Mama. I'm trying to, Mama. I just can't go to sleep, you know. Boing, boing, bing, bouncing off the walls and everything else. And then you just go in there and you just say, okay, I tried to tell you to go to sleep. You won't go to sleep. So now we got to lay hands on you. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, I take authority over that sleepless devil. I send him out. Man, I'm not careful. I'm going to throw my arm out of socket. The whole point, brothers and sisters, is that those spirits disguise themselves according to your personality. Don't get offended if somebody discerns that this is a spirit like your personality that you need to be helped with to get the victory over because it's not an accusation against you. There is a spirit, a parasite that has tried to leech your life away and destroy your life. Somebody said amen. amen. Tell the devil to get out of town. Tell him to get out of your life. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Why it's very important for you to understand that when you go to work, there are spirits that are waiting for you when you get there. Do you understand? And there are certain environments, whether it be your workplace or other places, that as soon as you walk in, there are spirits that are already there waiting for you. And you don't need it. You don't need that atmosphere. You don't need that workplace. You don't need that place where they're waiting for you to show up because they're looking for you to show up. And sometimes you don't even discern it, but somebody else can. Give God a hand clap of praise. Look to your table and say, we got to watch the atmospheres we go into. Because there are spirits that, and don't, don't, yeah, okay. So if it's a scared demon, okay, if it's a demon of fear, you know what you do? Just walk up to him and go, boo. Right? But there's a lot more spirits than booze, than scared demons. You got to know when you walk in the atmosphere. Somebody said, Praise the Lord. Because if you just go in there nonchalantly, like everything's cool, you're not walking in discernment. I will tell you, they that be with you are more than they that be with them. But be aware of those that are with them. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Because if you don't, the enemy's going to set a trap for us and bring us down. Somebody said, praise the Lord. 
Well, what are these spirits? I'm almost done. I'm almost done. But what do these, what do these spirits look like? If it's an angel that's not fallen, they always show up young. They don't show up in, as the appearance of a woman. Sorry, ladies. Say, amen. amen. They don't take on the appearance of a lady. Nothing against the ladies. And uh, they're not little fat babies with bows and arrows either. <laughs> you little fat babies with little wings sticking out the back with bows and arrows. No such thing as that either. <laughs> but if it's an angel, they always come and they appear as young men. And they don't come wearing beards. <laughs> Everybody say praise the Lord. They're thousands and thousands of years old. Maybe, who knows, maybe millions of years because they were created before God created this earth that we're on. I don't know how old they are. But when they appear, they appear to be about 30 years of age or maybe younger. And they appear as light because they're coming from an atmosphere of light. Because in God there is no darkness at all. So when they come, they come. Whoa, whoa, praise God. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost. Oh, hallelujah to the Lamb. Angels of light appear young. Amen. Handsome too. They don't, I don't think there's a thing as an ugly angel. Hallelujah. That one angel, that, that I saw two angels when I, the church was going to go through a battle to uh, forsaken holiness, you know. And don't, don't take that lightly because that don't mean the enemy doesn't come around again and try to make that happen. But the angel I saw, one of them walk in in that room where the ladies were. Oh, my Every one of you ladies in here would have had a heartbreak. You just, hallelujah. Woo. Blonde hair, bronze, hallelujah. Muscle, woo. Cut, ripped, ripped, cut. I didn't remember seeing any belly on them. Ripped. Bronze. Woo. Woo. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lamb. I don't believe God makes junk. God don't make no junk. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Praise the Lord. Amen. My father-in-law says, if you're ugly, you're just ugly. <laughs> We're going to change that. From if you're ugly, you're just ugly. We're going to change it. If you're ugly, do whatever you can to make ugly pretty. <laughs> Say praise the Lord. Whatever you can do to make ugly pretty, make it pretty. Hallelujah to the Lamb. <laughs> Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All the dead people say, praise the Lord. Yeah. All right. <laughs> you're still good, brother. Man, you're still good, boy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. It's okay. You'll get quick with the tree yeah, on. Praise the Lord, man. <laughs> say, praise the Lord. But you see a demonic spirit, all oh, that's gone. When they appear, they can appear like an angel of light. I told them this morning, a lot of people walk with spirits. They take them by the hand because when those spirits come, they come pretty. They come as an angel of light. 
And so that's why many people in the church will take them by the hand and walk with them because they appear to be beautiful. Johanna Michelson wrote a book called The Beautiful Side of Evil. If you can get your hands on it, read it. The Beautiful Side of Evil. How the devil sometimes comes in beauty to destroy. But you walk with that spirit for a little bit that you think is so beautiful. And you will notice all of a sudden the hand begins to change. Because that spirit through hundreds and hundreds of years of distortion. The flesh is rotting. It appears to be diseased. It appears to be rotting flesh. They don't even appear as a, hum- as a man anymore. They appear as something monstrous. That's what sin does. It turns an angel into a monster. Look at your neighbor and say, we need help. They're on our side there to help us. And I know you're tired, and I don't know why you're tired, but I can tell you're tired. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I said, said, when I got to church, I said, man, I didn't even get to take my power nap. (laughs) You know, what happens when you get old? I look at my wife and I say, I got a green chair sitting over in the corner in my house. And I said, I'm about to go take a chair nap. But I didn't even get a chair nap today. And I thought, okay, I'm going to go to the choir with practice. And I'm going to go in my office and I'm going to get in my chair, lean back, turn off the light, put my feet up on the desk. I'm going to go to sleep. Guess what? That didn't happen. Hallelujah. So I, I see you're tired. So I'm almost done. <laughs> Hallelujah. You get the point, right? They're on our side. You can't lose if you believe what I'm preaching. You can't lose. I can't lose. No matter what the, I'm going to say it again, no matter what the enemy throws at you, because there's two to one. Two for every one that may tempt us, deceive us, or, or seek to mislead us. A majority of them are with us. And guess what? They're not deteriorated. <laughs> Woo! Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I told you one time I went on a fast to find out the will of God, whether or not I was called to preach or not. I said, God, I'm going to fast till you send an angel to me. Hallelujah. (laughs) One day, no angel. Two days, no angel. Three days, no angel. Four days, no angel. Somebody said, you want to go eat at K-Bob's? I said, yeah. (laughs) I'll go get me a chicken fried steak. Woo, hallelujah. And God never sent me an angel, but guess what I I is? I'm preaching. I I have to believe you honored that four days. If I chicken and fried steak, it sure was good. (laughs) Hallelujah. Woo. Oh, the spiritual said amen. It's okay. Yeah, it's all right. That's not a trick. That's not a trick question. All the spiritual said, "Amen." Amen. Amen. You know your you know your spiritual when you break a fast chicken fried steak. Hallelujah. I'm going to very quickly go through this. Seven things that the devil's afraid of. Number one, your testimony. Your witness. The book of Revelation says they overcame him by 
the word of their test by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Diana, Diana, stand up right now and shout, I got the victory. Shout it. Shout it. Come on. Yeah. That's about as loud as she going to shout. Amen. See, that gives you victory. If the enemy can close your mouth, he knows that he's taken away one of your weapons. So don't stop witnessing. Don't stop testifying. Woo. The second one is the blood of the lamb. Say the blood of the lamb. Those are powerful weapons. In the Bible, whenever they wanted to, the enemy was coming, you know, down to the land of Israel to defeat them. You know what they would do? They would put the blood of a sacrificial animal between them and the enemy. Whoa. The enemy coming against you, those spirits coming against you, you start testifying. You mark it. You mark your territory. You declare something. Ah, you can't move me. In the name of Jesus, God is my strength. God is my victory. You witness the people, you win souls, you put the blood of Jesus Christ over you and your family. Powerful weapons. Number three, scriptures. Luke chapter four, Matthew chapter four, when the devil came against Jesus, he said, it is written. You, you start quoting scripture. It is written. You're a loser. You're a failure. You're going to hell. You can't be forgiven. It's over with. Now, if God says that different story. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, say, Diana, I'm back at you again. Say, praise the Lord. See how loud she's getting louder. I think we were octave two before now. That was like octave three. Is that, does it get louder when you're going up in octaves? Okay, we're going to make it that way anyway. Hallelujah. You got to, young people, you got to know that God will forgive you because there are times that you're going to stumble. There's going to be times, how you're hearing what I'm telling you. You've got you've to know that. Because if you don't, the enemy is going to come against you and remind you of every little thing you've ever done, said, thought to destroy you. No, in Jesus' name. I'm not trying to sin, don't want to sin. If, I, if we sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Look at your day saying, I'm free. I'm forgiven by the blood of the Lamb. Number four, the Holy Ghost. Look, help me preach because I'm getting tired. Sister Melvis, I want you to turn to somebody and preach. help me preach tonight and tell them, greater is he that's in me. She's, you know what, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to help her out tonight. You know where she is. She's up there with the angels in heaven. <laughs> and she shows up every once in a while here. And we, we, we are sure are glad that you show up every once in a while. Because normally you're up there with them somewhere. But anyway, praise the Lord. Help me while you're here. <laughs> Greater is he. 
that is in me than he that is in the world. It's your fourth weapon. Your fifth weapon, the name of Jesus. The name above every name. No demon can stand against the name of Jesus. Mark 16. Yeah. They shall cast out devils. <laughs> In my name shall they cast out devils. He don't, he, he, he can, listen. He don't stand a chance against these weapons because they're mighty through God. They're the weapons that God gave us, Tim. Hallelujah. <laughs> Number six, prayer and praise together. <clears throat> Prayer and praise together. And the reason why that we have to praise when we pray is because if we don't, we'll pray complaints. Oh, okay. I hear it. Yes, Lord. Okay. Brothers and sisters, let me, let me speak something to you right now. You women sometimes go through things, and I feel this in my spirit, discernment. You go through things in, you know, different seasons, if you understand what I'm saying. That doesn't mean you're backslid. That doesn't mean you're devil-possessed. Amen? You know that. Because when you get through it, you're all your old happy self again. Praise the Lord. So tonight, God, I bless every one of you ladies in the name of Jesus. I bless every one of you in the name of Jesus. Because I'm, yeah, praise God. If I look at your face, I might want to, in Jesus' name. <laughs> Hallelujah to the Lamb. Except I got God. Somebody said, hallelujah, 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 praise the Lord. So when you pray, you got to praise at the same time. Because that gets rid of the murmuring and the complaining and belly aching. Somebody said, Amen. So when you pray, you got to praise God. And when you pray, believe God. Believe what God says in His Word. By faith. Amen. You say, okay, I'm praying to God right now, and I'm just telling God how much I love Him. And if I tell God how much I love Him, then He's going to help me because I'm telling Him how much I love Him. And how much affection I have for him. Let me tell you something. You expressing your affection to God. Does not bring God's help to you. Faith. Brings God's help to you. Because if, if, if all it took was you standing there and saying Lord I love you. For God to come and help you, he would be violating his own principle of faith. He requires faith of you and I when we come into his presence. So when you come into his presence, tell him you love him, but exercise your faith. Believe his word. Prayer mixed with praise will bring victory to your life. Woo. Are y'all understanding tonight? Look at your and say, I believe God. I believe His Word. I'm not just going to say, Lord, I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord. Help me, Lord, because I love you. God's going to look at you and say, you need faith. <laughs> you got to believe His Word. Well, He knows, he, he knows he, that I love Him. Really? 
He knows that he loves you. Watch this. So when you stand there, I'm almost done. When you stand there and say, Lord, I love you, I love you, I love you. You know what you're really after? His affection for you. That's what you're really after. And I, I'm, listen, and I'm not minimizing the fact that you really are saying that you love him. But ultimately, all human beings need to be loved. So when you tell him you love him, really what you're saying is, I need you to love me. I need to tell you something. You don't need to change his mind. He already loves you. I preached that to you last Sunday. God loves you. He will not change his mind. So you don't have to stand and say, Lord, I love you, I love you, I love you, to get his love back for you. <coughs> say, Lord, I believe your word. <coughs> so prayer and praise, powerful weapon against the enemy. <coughs> Woo. Send the enemy away when they come to hound you. Amen. They're going to seek to destroy you. And the way oftentimes they do is... <clears throat> They will come to us and they will try to get us to carry a load we can't carry. Amen? Amen. Try to carry that. Here you are trying to carry that and you're not strong enough to carry that. Or they'll try to get you to live six days in one. Try to get you so... Listen, if he can't get you to be a hobo... No response. You understand? Then he's going to turn it the other way around and try to get you to live six days in one. So he can wear you out. Understand? Have you ever been there where that thing's just driving you? Something's driving you. It's a spirit. You thought it was just motive. Anything that comes to you that tries to give you a load you can't carry is not of God. Anything that's trying to get you to live more than one day at a time is not God. Anytime, anything that's trying to keep you bound to some future event is not God. Are y'all understanding this? Uses people to wear you out. People will come in your life to wear you out. They have no intention of living for the Lord. They are sent there by the enemy to wear you out. Amen? Amen. 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 T.W. Barnes, a spirit of depression came on him. He needed to know where that spirit was coming from. Spirit of depression, you know, couldn't rest. And they had been winning a lot of people from the occult in that area. And so he found out, God showed him somehow that what he was dealing with was there was the person that was ahead of those, <clears throat> the occult there was praying to demonic powers. And those demonic powers were, you know, being released and bringing depression on his life. Amen. Amen. So T.W. Barnes, all right, when he found that out, he told that spirit that was bringing that depression on him, that was trying to wear him out, he said, you go back where you came from. Yeah. You know, and that's the way he would talk. He would say, now, devil. That's the way he would talk. He'd say, now, now, devil, you go back to the person that sent you. Hallelujah. Amen, because those spirits are sent to wear you out. Amen, praise God. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Mm -mm -mm. So I'm in number six, right? Hallelujah. 
Say praise the Lord, church. I don't like the, these glasses fog up on me. I mean, I'm sweating and you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. See, the enemy doesn't want me to tell you this. And that's why I had to take time to find it. What he will do, he will seek to come into your life in such a way that you destroy your own faith. Do you hear what I said? That's why you and I have to keep believing God. Walking by faith. Because the enemy wants me to destroy my own faith. Last thing I'm going to address very quickly. Legalism. Any church. Especially a holiness church. Can legalism. The enemy wants to bring legalism to that house. What I mean by that is the whole church is run by rules. Okay, we're going to add this restriction. Then we're going to add this restriction. We're going to put this rule. Rule upon commandment. Commandment upon rule. Restriction upon restriction. So that the whole church is only governed by commands. And yes, we need to preach the commandments of God. But we don't need to add to them, reinterpret them, reapply them. Do you understand what I'm telling you? To make us better. That was the approach of the Pharisees. Their whole life was one lived by rule. What's that saying? That swallow a camel? Strain in a net. Strain in that. Strain in that. And swallow a camel. Oh, we can't. Thank you for putting it right. We got to make sure we strain the gnat out of the tea. Because if we drink the tea with the gnat in it, then we have defiled ourselves by an unclean animal. So we're going to strain the gnat so we don't drink the gnat and become defiled. But I'll swallow the camel. But they came up with a long list of rules, a reapplication, reinterpreting of the Word of God. The traditions of men added to the commandments of God in order to make themselves better. That's legalism. Everybody awake? So pretty soon a legalistic church gets like this. I'm going to look at myself as the one with the white hat. And I'm going to look at everybody else as the one with the black hat. So I'm going to pick them apart. Day by day. Because I got the white hat on. And they got the black hat on. You know what I'm trying to say, right? I'm better than they are. And that makes me feel good. To be able to pick them apart, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? So, hallelujah. Every one of you out there wearing a white hat in your mind. And everybody else is wearing the black hat. And that makes you feel really good. That's legalism. Brothers and sisters, we got Ten Commandments and we have a hard time keeping them. And we wouldn't be able to keep them except by the grace and power of God's Spirit. Lord, help us. I don't need another rule, another restriction. I don't need that. I got enough I'm trying to live up to. Hallelujah. To the Lamb. And I'm going to pre keep preaching the commands of God. But... A church must not just have restrictions and rules and commands. It can't function that way. You'll bite and devour each other. You will literally destroy each other. Because you're trying to make yourself feel good. So what do we have to preach then? Not just the commandments of God, but the promises of God. 
Amen? Amen. Well, pastor, I'm afraid of what you're saying. Well, get over it. We keep his commandments. Why? Because we, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It doesn't say, if you're scared to death, you'll keep my commandments. It says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So the promises of God need to be preached. And when the promises of God are preached, then your faith grows. And you walk in victory. We have to have a balance of commandments along with promises. If all I do is get up and preach commandments and restrictions and rules and command upon command, where's your faith going to come from? Faith doesn't come from commandments. Faith comes from promises. God doesn't want his church to become just a legalistic rule-keeping body. He wants to be a church that's full of faith and has victory. Say praise God, brothers and sisters. Would you stand? So tonight, take your white hat off. And take off the black hats off everybody else. Amen. And walk in faith in the promises of God. Yeah, and then you're going to hear me probably next Wednesday preach the commands of God. It's not a contradiction. I'm trying to bring balance to the assembly. Amen. See, the devil wants you to become so legalistic. And I challenge you as I let you go. What time is it? It's 8.15. Can you believe I preached that long? On a Sunday night. But I challenge you again to go watch Pilgrim's Progress. And you'll see that big old mountain of a man called legalism. You know what I mean? And Christian trying to make his way through all of those rules. and Everybody said amen. So God bless your heart. They that be with us are more than they that be with him. So you walk out in victory tonight. Look at your neighbor and say, now you know. And I give the honor to Kenneth Reeves, a man who walked with angels and saw angels for years and years and years. T.W. Barnes' best friend for giving us so much understanding about the spirit world. Amen. God bless your heart. Oh, let's praise the Lord one time. Would you lift up your hands? Glory to the Lamb, glory to the Lamb, glory to the Lamb. <coughs> oh God. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. See, that's why you have to have the Holy Ghost. Because if you don't, you forgot number seven. Y'all want me to give you number seven? Okay. Number seven, thank God for God. (laughs) Number seven is the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord encamps round about them. Amen. That fear him and he delivers them. That's number seven. Those are seven things that the enemy is afraid of. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So God bless your heart. I loaded your wagon tonight. Praise the Lord. I thank God for giving me that direction. Just give me that direction. You're going to walk out of here victorious tonight. Amen. Amen. You make up your mind. Nothing going to stop you. Nothing going to stop you. Okay, well, all right, I'm, okay, I'm letting you go. Hallelujah. I see you're tired. Okay. Love you. Good night. God bless you.
See you later.